Welcome to this week's edition of the DC Life. I'm your host, Sal Mora. I got my co-host, Michael Frankel. We got Sal Gomez, the photographer from Gomez Photo Works. And we have Mr. Jorge Hernandez, who's a TV personality, uh, Southwest Fight News as well, dot com. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Let's talk about the elephant in the room that happened this past weekend up at Buffalo Thunder Casino. Jackson's MMA series, the main event, Jordan Espinosa, Nick Urso, they fight for one and a half rounds. Jorge, what was your thoughts on that fight? I thought the first round was pretty good and competitive. Uh, early on, obviously, Urso had the advantage with that huge takedown that he capitalized on a pretty telegraphed flying knee from Jordan. But Jordan was able to get out of the, uh, obviously being down on the ground, a little bit of ground and pound from Urso, then getting back up and landing. I believe, I can't remember if it was a right or a left hand that floored Urso and obviously got Jordan back into the game. So you saw there the pendulum may have swung just just a little bit toward the end of the round. I personally scored that first round for Urso, despite the fact that uh, Jordan was ever able to drop him. I think it was in the, battle, the last minute or so of that round. But nonetheless, I thought it was a it was a pretty good fight overall up until that crazy no contest ending. I actually didn't see the shot to the back of uh, Jordan's head, but I did see him kind of full just for a split second as though I'm not sure if he was knocked out for a quick second but it obviously was the shot to the back of the head but overall a pretty good fight uh, a terrible ending though Jordan Espinosa those flying knees were just out of control weird two of them both times put on his back gave Urso easy takedowns Urso with the flash knockdown at the beginning of the round the first Espinosa got the ref to stand them up after being on the ground. The only thing that saved him from being there was inactivity. Espinosa got his knockdown. I looked at Jorge and asked him how he scored it just because I was thinking maybe could you go 9-8 there because they each had a knockdown, but Urso was on top. That's why I thought it was interesting. Second round, again, Espinosa with the weird flying knee, got put on his back, gave up bad position. Initially, when the when the ref was diving in, I thought it was for a stoppage. I'm pretty sure that's what Urso thought, too. But then you saw Espinosa grabbing the back of his head. It was really awkward and quick, though, because it seemed that the ref was trying to give him time. And before Espinosa had any time to recover, there's a doctor in there. The doctor's checking on him. There was no recovery time. So, of course, whether they were legal or illegal shots altogether, he took a lot of punches to the head. So you're figuring there was some effect on the replay, which I watched one time on the board, they showed it, but I was trying to watch the doctors. I saw five to seven punches that could be construed as to the back of the head, but then again, that was one time watching the replay and bad camera angles. So I do believe there was one legitimate to the back of the head that we saw on there that was a whopper. Odd ending, and you got to blame the doctor or the commission or something because... It went too fast. That fight was called within minutes of the foul, and it just all seemed to be a really quick process. We're in the UFC. You kind of watch this and get bored of waiting. We had no waiting, and that was lacking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in, in regards to the doctor, what happened was, okay, so the ref, everybody knows they get five minutes to recover. And the, the ref is in there talking to Jordan, giving him the five minutes, telling him he can recover. He did get the shots to the back of the head. You, you clearly saw it on the, on the replay. Everybody else clearly saw it on the replay as well. Uh, there were some warning shots. Was the fight close to being done? Possibly. Possibly. Now, so in terms of the, of the doctor coming in the cage, the ref never signaled for the doctor to come in. He was going to give him the five minutes. The cage crew that's provided by the Jackson's MMA series opened the cage. The doctor decided he wanted to go in, which the doctor is not an athletic commission doctor. He was provided by the promoter. The, the doctor came in because he felt he needed to check on Jordan prior to the five minutes even being up. He came in, Jordan and him discussed how many fingers. He said he, could, he was seen blurry, but he needed a little bit of time. He can continue. Uh, he gave the wrong answer on, on how many fingers are held up. That's when the ref, or, or the doctor told the ref, he is stopping this fight prior to the five minutes even being up. 
and and, and the ref isn't going to go against a doctor. Nobody is. Unless you're a doctor, you're not going to go against another doctor. You know what kind of liability that would be on not only the referee, but the Pueblo Puaca Athletic Commission, the promoter. If if they were to say to the fighter, hey, can you continue, even though the do on the advice of the doctor, they, he's the one that said he's stopping the fight. That's where all the confusion came from. Uh, no Nowhere was the ref motioning for the doctor to come in. It was supposed to be the five minutes he was going to... I thought Jordan was going to take the whole five minutes because his corner screaming at him to take the five minutes the whole time. Take your time, recover, let's get clear back in head. there. Clear your head, let's get back in there. Uh, again, I think it was a judgment on the uh, judgment error on the doctor's part, on the cage crew, uh, letting letting him into the cage. Although now, do you tell the doctor no when he says let me into the cage, being that he's the doctor and he felt he needed to intervene at that time? It, it, it was a weird main event to, and, and situation to happen. That situation, it's awful. It's no contest. Optimally, love to see a rematch. Don't believe there's much of a chance of that actually happening. I would actually want to see the rematch. What about you, Jorge? I would love to see that rematch. I think for the amount of hype, you know, uh, uh, you know we haven't gotten the, that decent size of an MMA crowd in a while. I mean, obviously, King of the Cage is able to get, you know, maybe it's obviously a little less than what we saw there. I, I don't know the exact figures, but I mean, just at, at first glance, it looked like there were 13, 1,400 people there last uh, Saturday night. But the rematch, I think it would be huge. You know, this one ended in kind of an awkward fashion. People seemed extremely hyped, uh, and mostly because of all the smack that Jordan Espinoza was talking pre-fight. So there was a lot of carryover from that. And the local scene, I think, I think needs the rematch. I don't know, you know, depending on what Nick Urso's people tell him about his potential of getting into the UFC. I know after the, the contest, he, I did have a chance to speak to him. And he's extremely hesitant about taking a rematch. Uh, he said he was tired of, uh, of doing the local fight. So if you take that, obviously he was full of passion. If you take that with a grain of salt, it's not clear if, it, if he will uh, take the, the fight again. But I definitely think it's something that's necessary. I mean, no contests are so rare in MMA. You see them a lot more in boxing. But I think that this is a fight or a, a chapter that was left unclosed. So it's still open between the two guys. Absolutely, and and you see it on Sunday morning uh, after the fights. You, you see the the little memes go up on social media from both sides and, and and talking trash to each other. And still, still, it's still brewing. It's still there. The promotion should play off of it. I even talked to the promoter at, at the event. And I said, "Hey, look, let them talk shit. Let them be out there giving giving that kind of attitude." Because I tell you what, people were coming into the fight shop here and asking for tickets if i was selling tickets and i'm like no and, they're, and i'm like well, well how'd you hear about it and they're like oh well we heard that this this that and the other on social media they're talking trash to each other and whatnot so it grew and it could grow even bigger with that with that happening huge event i would love to see the rematch i'm just doubtful that it comes to fruition i would love to see it it would be huge we also have the co-main event natalie roy had her moments on the feet, but I thought looked like she was fighting stiff, fighting weird. Audrey Perkins, great job taking the fight to the ground, grinding it out. Jorge, what were your thoughts? I but personally, it was you know a pretty good performance from Audrey Perkins for the most part. Uh, you know, Natalie Roy just didn't have the head movement that that Perkins had for the majority of the fight. Uh, Natalie Roy did rally there for a little bit, but just. He took a lot of shots up the middle, and I think Perkins' athleticism is what actually surprised her more than anything. I think only I gave uh, Roy the very last round, but the first two rounds I thought were pretty easy to award to Perkins. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you what, Andre Perkins surprised me. I really thought it was a sacrificial lamb. Oh, I mean, definitely. I'll be honest with you guys. I really, really did for Natalie. And and I think she she really caught Natalie off guard with, and to me she was, Natalie wasn't winning the striking either. I I don't think she was as much as everybody says that she was. I had her by a slim margin, but it was the, not but, the performance. But that there we wasn't thought. control. It wasn't it wasn't a, a total package for right. mixed martial arts. So so big win for her. 
it's it's another name in the 115, and we got a lot of 115ers around here that need fights. So Audrey could be somebody that they could bring back in and, and be an opponent for another female out of the Jacksons camp or another camp per se, and, and build the name up. Well, what about uh, Todd Sampson and John Sparks? This was an exhibition, obviously. You know, this, this was an exhibition. You guys will see this on uh, Discovery Channel. John Sparks. Woo! Do we get to actually give him a win? Because they announced it as part of the pro card. Does he get to move to four and two now? Uh, from what I understand, it, it was announced as a professional fight just for the TV purposes of the. Oh, filming. okay. So it wasn't an but exhibition, it, but it was actually one hundred percent an exhibition bout. Uh, from what I've heard, they were he was supposed to carry him a little bit for the first round. I think once he threw that first shot and it landed kind of clean on John, John kind of gave it to him a little bit more than what he wanted to. Um, <laughs> when he got hit with that switch step in uppercut, it looked like John felt bad for dropping him and Samson felt bad for having to stand in him for the rest of it, holding his jaw the whole time. The, uh, after the fight, I mean, we're walking, balls we're walking to the back and he's like, he's like, I think that guy broke my jaw. I think that guy broke my jaw. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> you wouldn't be talking. I don't know what to tell you. Like, you should have never got in there in two weeks' notice. What do you think about that fight? If you I could call mean, it that. It was, I guess it was kind of confusing as to, you know, what was going on, especially if you were in the crowd. Obviously, we, we knew the Discovery Channel was there for Todd Sampson. But if I were someone in the crowd, I guess I was a little confused. I'm not sure if they didn't fully announce that it was an exhibition fight. That way they get the full raw emotion of the crowd. And I think it, it did come across at instances. John Sparks, it was obvious, I think, there was one, one chance where he, he had the, the, the opportunity to mount Todd Sampson and was extremely so in, slow in his approach. So if that didn't give it away, I mean, I don't know what did, but I, Todd Sampson did eat some legitimate shots from John Sparks. I think he even cut him over the right eye, if I'm correct. Yeah, he did. So it, it was interesting. I wish they would have announced it to the crowd. I don't think they could, based on it being the, the Discovery Channel filming and whatnot. I think they wanted to try and get a raw emotion from the crowd in the sense of, A, let's not act like this is the greatest fight ever, but also let's, let's make it as real as possible. I think it backfired on them in the crowd. I think the crowd was really confused. You had some of the fighters that knew about it just dying laughing. I mean, I looked over at Demacio Page, and he is folded over laughing. You have Greg and Greg and Wink in the corner kind of like smirking, trying to hold themselves together as well. Cowboy Cerrone is yelling out of the guy that's fighting out of his own ranch, stop being a bully! Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, so it, it was a fun, it, it was fun for the fact that I'm curious to see how, how they edit this. And how they they cut it up. How do you show? make the look on faces on John's face look more entertained during the fight? I'm like, oh, this is gonna be bad for TV. Yeah, so it, it'll be interesting. Uh, let's move on to the amateur side of it. Let's touch on it. Ricky Escobel, Javier Cepeda. What were your thoughts on that fight, Jorge? I really enjoyed it. I'm surprised, you know, Ricky Escobel out. Uh, I think what was it? Has he been out about 16 months or so? Uh, I thought, 16. You know, yeah, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong there. But, yes, yeah, he impressed me the way he came out early on. He came out pretty pretty strong in that round. I think I ended up giving him the edge in that first round. I think Cepeda, you know, was a little more cautious or perhaps waiting to see what Esquivel had. And then he turned up the heat, obviously, in that second round. But Javier Cepeda, definitely a guy worth keeping your eye, uh, eye out on. I think that improves. I, know, I think they had the, his record wrong on the Bouchy. I think he improved, what, 7 8 Eight and zero, Micah. You might know that more than, than, than me, but eight and zero, extremely impressive. Uh, his boxing skills are, you know, pretty damn good. As you know, as we always expected, as his brothers, uh, his brother skills are as well. Uh, to me, it just kind of scares me. Javier Cepeda is a very interesting fighter, just because he keeps his hands down. I think to bait his opponents. I'm just worried if he runs into a pretty good boxer, he might get caught by a hook. But who knows? Maybe he'll be more protective in the future. But, I, I mean, Cepeda, he just impresses me every time I see him. But Ricky, also very impressive for the amount of time he had been off early on in that fight as well. But I definitely enjoyed it. Obviously, the result was a, was a submission for Cepeda, but a very entertaining foul. I think this was one of the maybe top two bouts of, of the night for me. Definitely up there, top two of the night for me too, Jorge. Cepeda, 
probably a little disappointed in himself for getting taken down. I think that's that that'd be key for him. But improving that jujitsu, his third actually amateur win by submission, as much as we talk about his boxing. So I know he's disappointed in his uh, takedown defense. We were backstage. I told him, why do you have this? Probably your mom has her heart in your throat defense talking about, as you were saying, his hands are down by his hips and he's just using a lot of head movement, shoulder roll, and he just kind of said, this is what I do. Kid hits hard. Escobel took on a hard opponent, a tough opponent. That's a hard fight to come back. That was a good win. Josana Olis, Mercedes White. Mercedes White, a big battle for her was coming off of pregnancy, getting back into the cage. And uh, she threw one spinning back fist that what really nailed Olis and woke her up. And Olis, first win that I've seen with her really displaying her hands. She showed off all boxing. We've seen her kicking in her first two wins. 3-0 now, 135 pounds. We need prospects up there all the time. What do you think, Ore? Yeah, that was a very tough fight for Mercedes. I think it may have been too soon for her to come back, especially when you come. I know they have mountains and stuff out there in Arizona, but when you come to the elevation, especially in, in Santa Fe and the Polaca, the Pueblo of Polaca, where it's much higher than Albuquerque, I uh, just thought it was a really tough fight. And, you know, I hope she takes some more, takes more time to train and, you know, obviously let her body get accustomed to the, the training and obviously, hopefully, I mean, at the elevation, if they're able uh, to do something as well. But that spinning back fist, though, you know, that was actually pretty impressive that she landed early on on all this. Marquis Smith, some will call it the upset of the night. He was only 1-0. and Jesse Tafoy is now 8-3. and Not the 8-5. and For some reason, the promotion announced his record. I know he is upset about that, that he wants him to get it right. But Tafoy stood there with Smith. Smith was more athletic made Tafoya get hurt. He finished him. We had the punches against the cage, head kick, finished him with the punches. The first round, Tafoya was able to get the takedown, controlled the end, but that second we saw the finish from Smith. Smith now jumps up there to one of the top prospects in the region. Jorge? Oh, no, definitely, definitely tough guy, especially against such a good grappler like Jesse Tafoya. The, the, the week leading up to the fight, uh, myself and uh, the other writer for Southwest Fight News, uh, Phil Lujan, were discussing this fight. And I, the whole time I told him, I was like, Marquis Scott's hands, Marquis Scott's hands is all I kept saying to him. And he definitely showed it. The speed was just incredible. I, I mean, just by the naked eye, it looked like he outpunched Tafoya 3-1 to one in that contest. And ultimately, it was the boxing that helped set up a lot of that groundwork as well. And <laughs> ultimately, at the end of the fight, and a lot of people were confused as to why he ran to, to our side of the press table, especially looking right at me and screaming just emphatically, right there, right there. I think his team used an article that had, Phil had written simply discussing the experience advantage. It wasn't a whole lot, to be honest. Simply just said, hey, Marquise has one fight, Jesse Tafoya has nine. That's as simple as what the comment was, and I saw that his coach online did use it as a sort of motivation. So he did apologize to us afterwards. I told him there was no beef. I was like, I completely understand. You know, he's, he's using it as, as for motivation, and I could completely understand the passion that he had. So I wasn't offended by that at all. It just it, it's impressive and definitely a prospect to look into here in the region. Absolutely, and I, I have to agree with you on that. He's he's definitely the 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 hot guy out right now, especially with this win. Uh, it was Jesse Tafoya's fight to lose, and, and what I mean by that, I think I, I blame I blame his corner because they have been putting pressure on this kid since he was fighting in King of the Cage a couple time a couple fights prior, prior. trying to say you got to get a knockout to get turn pro, you got to get a knockout to turn pro. Why are you putting that kind of pressure on this kid to stay standing when you know if he could get the fight to the ground and and buzz saw you on the ground, then let him finish the fights like that. This guy has come into the fight shop in New Mexico, cut up, busted up, and I'm asking him, I'm like, did you win? And he's like, yeah, I won. But why are you allowing this kid to take so much damage? To just just to prove a point of of oh I got a I got a knockout win it doesn't make sense to me why they would why they would set this guy up like this it just it just doesn't and I knew it and I said it last week I said it the week before if he tries to stay standing with the Marquise will will have the advantage and possibly be able to knock him out and then you also saw Marquise was just a bigger stronger faster athlete yeah. at 135 pounds it, it, now. He came down from Dallas because he's living in Dallas now. 
he flew down here, he trained here, that's all he did. If they can keep him, his corner's telling me they're trying to keep him here in New Mexico and keep him, his daughter's here in New Mexico, so they're trying to keep him here, keep him training, get him fights, whether it be on King of the Cage, Jackson's MMA series, anywhere they can. And right now, you know, if I was the King of the Cage and I'm coming back to Albuquerque area or, or El Paso, heck, you might as well put him on. You know, he's, 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 a, hot, he's a hot number now. And we'll go from there. I had interviewed him a month ago. He was extremely confident, extremely excited, extremely motivated. He knew how big of a prospect, how big of an opportunity he was. He cashed in on it. Also, fighting from the same gym, his teammate, Fernando Sanchez, did not have his good night. He fought Slade Ring. Slade should be down at flyweight. This fight was 140 pounds after the weigh-ins. And he did what he had to do. He wanted to work on his striking. He couldn't do that against a bigger opponent. Took the fight to the ground. Beautiful Darish choke. I believe that Southwest Fight News and Jorge, they called it their submission of the night. I'm going to actually give mine to uh, Javier Cepeda. I thought that was a, a great submission after having hurt um, Ricky on the feet. But Jorge, tell us what your thoughts were about Slade's performance. I, I mean, it was exceptional, especially in that second and third round. I, I actually gave the edge to Sanchez in that first round. I thought those kicks... And his, uh, you know, takedown defense were, were pretty good. Uh, his his kicks were actually leaving a mark on Slate Rings. And then Slate tends to, his legs and his body tends to mark easily. So that's not a true indication on whether those were, they're actually hurting Slate Ring. But nonetheless, they were leaving its mark. And obviously for the judges, that's, that, that's a pronouncing effect that his blows had. But second round, third round. You know, Ring was able just to take over, and the Darce choke, man, it's one of my favorite submissions to see. So anytime I see it, it's going to be up there as one of one of my submissions of the night. But definitely good performance for Slade to come back from a uh, kind of a an iffy first round. Charles Lee and Jake Angel fought, both making their amateur debuts. Lee looks like he's right at home in a lightweight. Rick ripped up, cut out of stone, hard strikes, good overall. Three rounds controlling the fight. Found the finish with a late flurry against the cage, dropping and hurting Angel, who Angel came in off a wrestling background, a jiu-jitsu guy, never found his way to the ground, did not look confident throwing his hands. Great win for Lee. Angel, maybe it's a little more sparring. We see him drop down a weight class. We might see more out of him. What did you think, Jorge? That's the, the first round was, was very competitive, but you're right, Charles Lee just you know, taking over, and it was, you know, the, the kickboxing that that impressed me is obviously Lee's strength as well. You you kind of rise that, brought that up. There were a few times where he did bully Angel up against the cage, but, you know, Lee worked for that TKO, and you know, it, was, it was late in the third round where he actually finished it, but nonetheless, pretty good performance for Lee. Hunter Tower, we see his dimensions to his game growing. Got the takedown, got to mount, got the TKO in the second round over Ortega. He's an interesting prospect up at welterweight. Jorge, how do you feel about Hunter Tower? I like him. He's pretty entertaining. Every time I've seen him, he, he comes to entertain. I mean, the, the switch kicks, the kicks that lands, his you know, short offensive attack is pretty entertaining. He's a pretty athletic guy, I think, and... Uh, for Steve, you know, Ortega, it was just a, a difficult fight to have. I think just the amount of, uh, I guess, of tools that Tower has in his arsenal was just very confusing. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm willing, anytime Hunter Tower's on the card, I'll, I, I know I'm going to see something exciting out of him. Al Toro Tex, Chris Gonzalez put the grind on against Seth Abeda, who was really throwing single kicks, looking for one big knockout. Gonzalez grinding him up, put him against the cage, put him on the fence, threw a lot of punches. Good win for him in the decision. And then we'll also, in the same aspect, Mark Miguel grinded out Tyler Starr for a split decision win. Close fight. We'll wrap it up, Jorge. Those were the first two fights tonight. What were your feelings? I thought Chris Gonzalez, you know, had to definitely the pretty good game plan. I think he figured it out from the beginning that if he continued to put the pressure on Abeta, it, he would just overwhelm him. And obviously, tough, tough fight for Abeta, but nonetheless, he was uh, he held on for all thirty rounds. As far as the opening fight of the night up for McGill and Tyler Starr, I mean, that's I think the split decision is uh, Mike. I'm not sure how you scored it, but I actually had the first. Two rounds for uh, McGill, and then the third, four star. But it's very competitive contest, and both guys for you know being, I guess, new as far as uh, competitive fighting. Did the scene, uh, you know, both of your guys impressed me. 
Same thoughts, close fight. I really thought it could have went either way. There were some close rounds, a lot of positioning for McGill, more activity and trying to finish the fight from Star. Interesting. I got to agree with you on fight of the night was Tafoya and Smith. Fighter of the event, definitely we got to give it to Smith. Knockout, I'm going to give to Josana Olis because of dropping Mercedes after a lot of punches with the one right. That was great. Jackson's MMA series is great. We look forward to hopefully seeing a rematch and a final chapter to Urso Espinosa. Jorge, we got to thank you for joining us to recap the event. I right, appreciate it, guys. Anytime. See you at Combat Sports Weekly. The Fight Shop New Mexico in the Montano Plaza Shopping Center, located off Coors and Montano. International Strategic Partners, not just another security company. Protection for home, business, and self. With background checks, self-defense courses, handgun, firearm licensing, security, and investigation services available. Contact ISP at 505-255-255. 6063. That's 505 255 6063 or online at callisp.com. We're back on the DC Life Uncensored. Got Albuquerque's Pitbull, Josh Pitbull Torres, joining us. Zab Judah, the news is everywhere. It's a huge fight. Thank you for the time, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. So what does it mean for you, the biggest fight of your career? Well, this is the next step. You know, we, we knew that eventually we had to take a plunge and take a big chance, and we feel like this is the right fight, the right time. We feel strong, we feel ready, so we're excited. So was it a believe it or not moment getting this kind of call, and then actually the process of getting the fight together went well? Mm -hmm. You know, it was believable because we've, we've had big calls before, but this is, you know, a time in our career that we felt ready. We felt, um, we felt like it was the right kind of fight that we needed to take. So, you know, we're very excited. So the progression of the, of the fights that you've had from when I first started, I believe the first night I saw you was against Joe Gomez, and then you've had against Jose Luis Sanchez. Tell us a little bit about the progression and the progression of your opponents and toughness. Yeah, I feel that. You know, since the beginning of my career, I've always fought tough opponents, and I think that it shows in my career. Uh, you don't end up with a 15-4-2 and two record for nothing. You know, I've never really had a promoter or manager on my side to guide me and to, you know, feed me the right kind of fights. So, you know, we're just excited to take that plunge, and hopefully after this fight, a big win. Maybe somebody will want to sign us and, and take care of us a little bit after this. So you look back on it, like we've said, 19 fights, almost 20 fights now under your belt. Was there one that you look back on it and you think, wow, that was actually harder than it really felt when it was happening? Probably the Joe Gomez fight. Uh, we were just coming off a tough loss in Colorado. We'd just been in a war, and then I fought Joe Gomez, I don't know, two, three weeks after. So to know that I did that, coming off such a hard fight already, fighting the veteran Joe Gomez, I think uh, it was pretty difficult, but I think it was you know, that turning point in my career where I knew that, hey, you know what, maybe this is something that I can do. Maybe it's something that I can be successful at. And then you've talked about these hard fights, the recent losses. What's been the biggest learning experience out of these last two losses? Those were the two that were most recent. Yeah, probably my most recent loss against Cam and Krill. I think that was an eye-opener because um, it showed me that I need to dig deep. It showed me what I was made of and what I'm capable of. Uh, you know, when, when you're in that ring and, and things go wrong, you can react a bunch of certain ways, and I think that I handled myself okay. I, I, I didn't, you know give up, I kept fighting, and I finished strong. So, you know, it, it proved a lot, you know, to, to myself and hopefully to the fans to show them what I'm made of. And, you know, sky's the limit from here. I just hope that we could keep moving forward, keep winning, and keep performing well. So you took a loss. How long did it take to find that positive? Not very long. I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't stay down very long. When you knock me down, I get right back up. It was actually more motivating than it was, you know, bringing me down because, like I said, it proved a lot to myself. So we use that as a learning point, and we're just uh, building and building from there. And that loss happened out in Grants. 
and then you got to come back home really here in the South Valley and you collected a win now before this. So what was that like having that home support, getting that win, having that positivity to get back on track for one of these big fights? Yeah, it's always great fighting in your hometown, but even out in Grants and the majority of the places that I go, my my family and all my good close supporters are always there with me anyway, so I always feel a sense of, of support behind me either way. But yeah, it's always great coming off of a win, especially a TKO win. So the mindset is right coming into this fight against uh, Zab Judah, and that's exactly what we need to do. We need to have the right mindset, the right game plan, and we need to be ready physically, and we feel that we're going to be ready for all the above. March 12th, it's going to be on TV. He's a former world champion. Obviously, your toughest test. Bright lights of Vegas. You're the underdog. How, with all these odds, all these new experiences coming your way, how do you turn this into your benefit? You know, it's, it's just exciting. Uh, the other day on Instagram, he mentioned my name on, on his page. So to know that I'm actually going to share the ring with legendary Zab Judah, a future Hall of Famer, it's just awesome. It makes, it makes all the training worth it. It's very inspiring when I'm in the gym. It makes me push myself that much harder. First press conference, Zab Judah is making his return. You're that prospect that he's looking to pick apart. Obviously, he's going to dog you. He's going to have some heat and emotion because he wouldn't be making a return if he didn't. How do you handle that when I'm sure you're going to just want to smile like I'm in front of a, a legend, this is going to be awesome. How do you get mean and how do you have a stare down then? It's going to be tough. I think that's going to be probably harder than the fight, just all the build-up coming into the fight. Uh, I think it's going to be hard not to just ask for his autograph when I meet him at the press conference. I mean, I don't know. We're just going to have to see. But uh, we're strong mentally. We're strong physically. So, you know, we'll stick to the game plan and we'll take care of business. And then after the fight... Hopefully he'll uh, give me an autograph and, and we could become friends. I was going to say, it's going to be a moment before the press conference. You're like, hey, can we meet real quick? Because I just have to get the little kid out of me and be like, hi, hi, hi. Okay, we'll do business now. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's very surreal and it's very exciting. We're just very blessed and very honored to have this kind of opportunity at this point in my career. And then we know how much you love your state. What does it mean to you to also be getting out there, likes of Tapia, Romero, Maldonado, Trout, home, representing New Mexico on such a huge stage? Yeah, it feels great, especially with all the support that I've been getting so far. And, I mean, we've only announced this maybe about a, less than a week ago. So to know all the support I'm already getting, it's awesome. Uh, New Mexico and Albuquerque has always been a great support system of mine. So, you know, I'm just very excited to perform for them, to show them what we're made of and go out there and just, you know, give it our all. Can't talk about the fight too much, you know, P's and Q's, what you're going to do, but what do you feel is going to be very instrumental to the victory March 12th? You know, we have to be on. We can't let him dictate the pace. We can't let him use his uh, veteran tactics. We just have to go in there with confidence, with strength. We have to take the fight to him, and we're confident that our game plan is going to work come March 12th. The supporters, the locals, what's the message? Hey, guys, get out there. Book your flights, book your rooms now. It's going to be March, the week of March Madness. It's going to be a packed house. You don't want to miss it. If you can't make it out there, tune in on TV, CBS Sports. I appreciate all the support, all your prayers. Uh, you guys are appreciated more than you know. Thank you, guys. A lot of big things going on in boxing. Thank you for the time, Josh Pitbull Torres. Tons of boxing going on in New Mexico. Looking forward to seeing Josh Torres on that big stage, March 12th out in Las Vegas, the bright lights, but we're going to see the bright lights this weekend locally, Camel Rock Casino, Legacy Boxing Promotions presenting Rumble at The Rock 2, we got an update for the card for you, Michael Bengay versus Marcus Oliveira, we got Joshua Greer, a returning Joshua Greer, kids from Chicago, devastating with knockouts, undefeated, taking on Gabriel Braxton. Matthew, the Diamond Boy Griego. People say he's the reincarnation of Johnny Tapia. He will be back on the card. The opponent, as we stand here recording this, is still yet to sign his contract, but I've been promised by the promotion that Griego, who has a huge following that's going to be great for a massive crowd up there, will be in action. Hopefully, with this being his second bout, we can see him a little more under control. He was a little just out, out, out of control up at Buffalo Thunder. Hopefully, he can... Enjoy the moment somewhat more. Also, a fight that's still together that we've been talking about for a while, Jesus Luis Sanchez. A lot of injuries, a lot of things have been in his way of getting back in the ring. He's taking on an undefeated Ambrosio Batista. Someone's getting knocked out in that fight. They both swing hard. Women debuting in the ring for Legacy Boxing. You have Amberly Trujillo and Denisha Lopez. That's Espanola versus Albuquerque. 
Can't wait to see what these ladies bring in the card. Really don't know too much on them. You got Jason Sanchez, John Herrera. Herrera, we know he's a slow pace fighter. He's going to try to stay technical. Expect for Sanchez to put the pace on him and this one to go the distance. But Herrera does swing hard. Could see a knockout at any point. Co-main event. We're going to get an interview on CageMinds.com with Jesus Xavier Pacheco from Albuquerque taking on David Proa. We're looking for angles, movement, combinations from Pacheco. Pro is looking for that knockout coming from Atrisco Boxing. I've been told by Fidel Maldonado that if he can land, he can win. And in the main event, we also have an interview up on CageMinds.com with him. Tony the Warrior Valdez. We're going to have to republish that. You can check it out at the Facebook page. Taking on Raymond Chacon. Chacon, been on a losing streak, but he's more than a battle-tested fighter. That's going to be an exciting one. Valdez always brings excitement. So it's going to be a great night of action if you can head up to Camel Rock Casino. That's the local boxing scene. The DC Life Uncensored will be back after this. we got still a whole lot more to talk about. International Strategic Partners, not just another security company. Protection for home, business, and self. With background checks, self-defense courses, handgun, firearm licensing, security, and investigation services available. Contact ISP at 505-255-6063. That's 505-255-6063. 6063 or online at callisp.com. Fight Shop New Mexico in the Montano Plaza Shopping Center, located off Coors in Montano. All right, we're back. This is the DC Life. I'm Samora. I got Michael Frankel. It was a good show overall. We touched on the Jackson MMA series. That was the big local fight. Uh, I love the shit talking back and forth from the fighters. We had an interview, you, Micah, you had an interview with, with, with Josh Torres, who's going to be fighting Zab Judah, Super Jab, Zab Judah, one of the guys I, I really liked watching in his heyday, a multi-time world champion. That's an exciting fight coming up and a big fight for New Mexico fight fans. Uh, we touched on the boxing. Let's touch on everything else going on in the CageMinds.com segment of the show. Well, we'll start off right there with this past Friday. Our very own Yo Gomez Photo Works, Sal Gomez, he's a jack of all trades. He was DJing. We were at Fit NHB. They had Battlegrounds. The kids always put on a show. We got results at CageMinds.com for that. We're going to have some photos on the Facebook page here going up shortly. Eduardo Silva was third to last fight of the night. This kid always brings it. He's from Perez Fighting System. Awkward style. Does talk some trash, but he has an excitement to his game and just his personality. Makes him really fun to watch. He takes big shots, delivers big shots. In the main event, we had a, the one and only Muay Thai match of the night. Austin Lewis put on a clinic. We have a ton of pictures up to check out that. He's just vicious with the knees. Local scene, a lot of love for the amateurs. That kid, undefeated as far as we've seen him at the Smokers. In the cage, Austin Lewis, baby brother of Amber Brown. Keep an eye out for that young man and an ear for his name. So that was big locally. Locally also, we were talking about the Jackson's MMA series. I don't think we've mentioned that again they were talking about there. That will be back Buffalo Thunder May 14th, right, Sal? Yes. Holmes Boxing, and it's rumored, title fight in the main event, Alex Holguin and Patrick Holmes Jr. I'll have an article on that as soon as I can get confirmation from both sides, but that would be second biggest fight in recent memory next to the Ganoi Pitbull fight, which was the WBC title fight. So this would be huge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would it would be a fun fight. Hopefully we get some back and forth banter to build it up. Uh, and we see that. You, you see, you know, when, when the fighters actually sell the fight as well, I, I agree to a certain degree that the promoters have to promote the fight, but there is. But there's also other ways to do it, and that's to get these guys on camera, get them to talk a little bit of smack talk back and forth, 
let let's get these heated rivalries back up against each other, and, and let's let's make these events special. Then, also talking about the local scene. This Friday, we already touched and previewed earlier the boxing. We have Havoc and Hobbs, MMA, School of Hard Knocks Promotions. Going to be out there. It's Pro-Am making his professional debut in the main event. Jarrell Spannenberg versus uh, Angel Castillo, who's from Texas. Spannenberg, we've seen his submission game. He's long. He's lengthy. There's a whole ton of well-known amateurs going to be on the card. Austin Verms, Randy Morales. And also Dakota Morano. We have an incorrection on the site that it says Slade Ring's going to be in action. As soon as we can get everything updated, we will. Havoc and Hobbs, though, it's MMA action. Those little shows, they always bring delight and surprises. These are guys we haven't heard of. I'm sure they're all looking to bring it and make huge impressions. So that's the local scene. We talked about Friday, we talked about Saturday. Then we got to hit the national because there's a whole lot of national that we have not talked about in this episode and not the events. But we're going to start off with the news. We've talked about free agency. Benson Henderson's Bellator bound. But the other two big names, Alistair Overeem and Aljermaine Sterling, have actually stayed and re signed, it looks like, with the UFC. Color me a little surprised about Overeem, more than a little. Uh, well, show me the money. And I'm not, you know, they're, they're represented well by Melky Kawa, who's also John's Jones' manager. So uh, love him, like him, hate him. That guy is all about his athletes at all times, and it's all about making that money because obviously he wants his cut, but he, he's got that hustle as well for his fighters to make the most money possible for them. Uh, so congratulations to both gentlemen on, on making it back inside the UFC cage. I'm actually really happy that the UFC saw the value in Sterling. Huge potential uh, star yeah, on the rise, absolutely. future bantamweight champion. You know, he, he's he's a young, young, the younger side of the generation that's coming up now, and and I'm excited that they saw that as well, moving forward and and going going from there. Then Friday night, let's get on to the national stuff that's happening this week and stack packed, jacked big weekend. Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock 3. I know Gomez is in the background having a mangasm. If this lasts one out of out more than one round, I'm going to be kind of surprised if Shamrock has the gas to do it based on what we saw out of him last time. I'm almost willing to go with Gracie just because I believe he's in better shape. Uh, it's a pick em. I, I, it's, it's, it's a look. If, again, if the UFC can complain and, and do, do things with, with, uh, with, with, um, CM Punk. There you Phil go. Brooks. Phil there Brooks. There you go. With this dude and going O and O and O one and O versus O and O, then nobody should have any room to talk about the pioneers of the sport getting back in the cage and doing something. Okay, and then we'll talk about O and O. Dota five thousand. Kimbo slice. Okay. I. Go get a sandwich. Go enjoy a meal. By the time they're done with all the hype, there'll be thirty seconds of two guys swinging at each other, and someone's gonna get knocked out. Uh, ho ho again, you know, UFC's doing it, nobody's complaining about it, except for me, it seems like, uh, and nobody bats an eye in that direction, so hey, let's do it. Kim Kimbo's proven, and I'll say that again, Kimbo is proven, He's he went through the Ultimate Fighter, he fought in the UFC, Dada is not proven, but again, if the UFC can do it with CM Punk, I have no problem with Bellator doing it, what's, what's good for one is good for the other. Derek Campos, Melvin Gillard. We'll see if Melvin Gillard has anything left. Daniel Pineda, Ma Emmanuel Sanchez. Two young prospects there. Linton Vassell, Emmanuel Newton. Vassell looking for revenge. WSOF, if anybody knows, they're also going to be throwing an event this weekend. You can only talk about the main event. Marlon Moray is one of the few fighters on their card worth uh, giving a look to in a bantamweight title bout, defending his title. Joseph Boreas, his uh, opponent. I wish I could tell you guys something, but look for Moray's and his striking. Also, from out here, representing Jackson Winks, Timor Valia will be on that main card. He should be in this title fight. Look for him to win and then move on to meet Moray's, in which will actually be a decent fight coming from World Series of Fighting. And then in a car that has had a lot of twists and turns and ups and downs, we're talking about UFC Fight Night 
83. We know that Tim Means debacle. Supplements are being tested. B samples are being tested. Clarity will all come through. One of, you know, we haven't talked about this much publicly, but I support Tim Means until he is proven guilty. I'll do that for any fighter, especially with the supplements and all the things that are going on, and who knows if he can trust the label. So we'll see how that works out. We also recently found out John Lineker due to a infection, a fever, and a mosquito bite, very dangerous, life-threatening situation, it sounds like. He is off the card. But we got a lot of exciting fights on that card. Ashley Evan Smith, Marion Renault. We remember Miss Renault from fighting against Holly Holmes. Smith is the one who ended the hype of Fallon Fox. Should be a tough fight at Bantamweight. Trevor Hotsaw Smith, Leonardo Augusto Gomarez. A lot of unsung talent on this card. You also got Daniel Serafian. Fight on the prelims to really look out for. Alex Garcia, Sean Strickland. Strickland, a former King of the Cage mid middleweight champion. Garcia, headhunter from the Dominican Republic, training out of the TriStar Gym. We're not making many picks right now. We're doing this kind of quick. The James Krause back in. Hopefully he can get his head right. Chris Camozzi, Joe Riggs, a battle of wills that will be entertaining. Dennis Bermudez in the biggest fight of his career against... To see it, to say you coward, to say you coward jury and coward jury in the same verse. Even though he's a veteran, can he get a big win on American soil? Japanese fighters have hard times against that against wrestlers. Cardi, Kobe, uh, Cody Garbrandt is obviously now off the card. It was sad. He spent a lot of time down here working with Brandon Gibson with Lineker out. That is a bantamweight fight that was really sure to deliver. That's now off. Derek Brunson, Rowan Corn. Cadero in the co-main event. Look for Brunson, his wrestling, his striking ability. It's all really coming together. He's a middleweight contender. And then a banger of a main event, Donald Cerrone, Alex Oliveira. Oliveira is unsung, but he's beat KJ Noons. He has put pressure on people. I got to go with Cerrone because we know he's the short notice king and he's just going to go out to the brawl. But this one is a pick of also because there's going to be a fight. It's just going to be a fight. It'll be a good fight. It's something that I, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed on in the fact that it, it's changed from Timmy. Too bad, you know, that that had to happen. But, uh, you know, it, it'll be a good weekend of national and local fights. Michael, before we close it up, anything you got to ask to say? Um. There's a lot going on this weekend. Cageminds.com. We're going to have interviews up. Josh Torres, Randy Morales. Check those out. Tony Valdez, Xavier Pacheco. A ton of events. Come out. Join us if you can in Hobbs, in Santa Fe, at Camel Rock. If not Sunday, definitely join me on Twitter. We'll be talking about UFC Fight Night 83. Well, that's it for this week's edition of the DC Life Uncensored. The DC Life is recorded Every week inside the Fight Shop in New Mexico on Coors de Montano in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We'll see you next week. We got a lot to talk about, a lot to touch on. That's the DC Life. Mm -hmm.